Hi, I'm Darren and welcome back to Level Up Double E Lab. Well, as it turns out, the third time is a charm for me trying to make an RF preamplifier for my HF transmitter project. Let's check it out. While I was wrestling with these problems with my RF preamplifier designs, I decided to take a step back and look again at the power coming out of the second mixer. And I looked again at my choice for carrying over these bandpass filters that I made for my simple HF receiver project. And I'm glad I took that step back because I found something that helped me solve this problem. Back in episode number seven, I talked about the second mixer and I showed the performance at 80 meters using the same bandpass filter that I made for my simple HF receiver. At the time, I commented that I was seeing minus 20 dBm after the filter, which was less than I budgeted, and I said something about maybe there being more losses in the filter than I expected. So I just assumed I'd have minus 20 dBm available for my RF preamp on all the bands, and I moved forward to design one that could get to at least plus 27 dBm to feed the final PA. Now at the time that I built those filters for my simple HF receiver, I did not have my Nano VNA. So I decided to check them out on it, and let me just say that I just discovered this Nano VNA saver program from Rune Broberg, and man, it's freaking awesome! Among other things, it lets you do segmented sweeps and export the data, so getting a thousand point sweep, for example, is now a piece of cake. And the data is in. Those filters do indeed have a high insertion loss, a minimum of 5 dB in band. Now that's making the job of designing the preamp all that much harder. Now, in my defense, for that receiver, I didn't choose filter designs that had minimal insertion losses. Rather, I needed designs with really steep skirts because they're being used as pre-selectors ahead of the first mixer. But for my transmitter, I really don't need such steep skirts, and having minimal insertion loss would be a big help. So I looked for something better, and I quickly found these filters from QRP Labs. Their advertised insertion losses are between 1 to 2 dB on most amateur bands. And they're compatible with my mixer output level. The trade-off is their attenuation skirts are shallower than mine, but they look steep enough to do the job. So I ordered them and built them up. Naturally, their footprint is different from mine, plus they don't have my feature for auto band detection, but I didn't let that stop me. Leave it to the mechanical engineer to come up with an adapter. Now they'll fit to my existing socket, plus I added the resistors needed for auto detection. Okay, so how much better are they? Well, here's how they compare to mine. <laughs> There's really no comparison in insertion loss. They are significantly better. And as I said earlier, their skirts are shallower, but I think they're fine because their main purpose in this application is to attenuate mixer harmonics, especially the odd harmonics of the VFO frequency. I also designed and 3D printed these nifty holders for these new filters. This will make identification and insertion easier, plus they provide some physical protection for the inductors. So with these new 40, 20, and 15 meter filters installed one at a time in the rig, here's the power output that I measured. This will be what's feeding into the RF preamp. It's now up to around minus 12 dBm on average, significantly stronger than the minus 20 dBm that I assumed I'd have. There's a few dB boost in those numbers beyond the filter losses because I was also off slightly on just how much power is coming out of the second mixer. This change makes solving the RF preamp problem simpler. I now only need around 39 dB of total gain instead of 47 to get to my minimum target of plus 27 dBm. With that in mind, I updated the push-pull design that I showed earlier in this series, and here's what it looks like now. I changed the first stage to increase the bias current to 34 milliamps to keep it solidly in class A with the stronger input signal. Plus, I simplified the collector to emitter feedback. It now matches very closely to a design shown in the November 81 issue of QST. I also increased the Pi network from 3 dB to 6 dB of attenuation to keep from overdriving the second stage. Here in the second stage, I made similar changes. It now produces about a 70 to 1 current amplification to drive the higher impedance primary of T1. And in the final, I added 220 ohms of feedback to dampen some non-linearities at 21 MHz that I was seeing in my first test trials. I also dropped the emitter resistance from 5 ohms to 2 ohms to help compensate for the gain lost by adding that feedback. 
Of course I had to update my LT Spice simulation to include these changes, and here it is. I'm right on to the new target of getting plus 27 dBm from minus 12 dBm of input. Now, it may look like this design can handle quite a bit more input power, but I've learned from this project that calculating gain compression from LT Spice simulation data does not correlate well to actual performance. Board assembly was a bit tricky because of the low number of turns on two of the three toroid transformers. My first attempt did not perform very well. I think it was because I made them as individual windings and that might have caused excessive flux leakage. But I redid them as bifilar windings and that seemed to fix the issue. Other than that, the rest of the assembly went just fine. So let's get this bad boy hooked up and checked out. Okay, I've got the amplifier all set up here. Let me go through the equipment um, that's all connected. Of course, I have to put the 50 ohm dummy load on the output of the amp and I've got my 10 times probe going to my 465 so we can look uh, at the quality of the signal. And now uh, this is configured for oscilloscope. I'll set it up later with my spectrum analyzer so we can look in more detail at the signal. I've got the Heath power supply in the background back here, powering it, of course. I'm keeping track of the current that it's drawing on my Keithley uh, DMM here. And right now it's about 116 milliamps. That does check fine with what the LT Spice simulation predicted. And I also took the schematic, this is another good practice, uh, marked it up with what the emitter, base, and collector nominal DC mode operating voltages were predicted to be. I checked them and they're all very close, no issues there. And then the other element, of course, I need a signal generator. My 8657A is providing the input to the amp. And so I've got it set to minus 10 dBm. So let's have a look and that signal doesn't look too bad. Now, of course, one thing that I've learned from this little exercise is, even though that might look like a pretty decent sine wave, you really can't tell what the harmonics are unless you have a spectrum analyzer. So I'll, like I say, reconfigure it for the next uh, portion here. We can take a look at it in that mode. So that's not too bad. There wasn't anything that looked really squirrely. It wasn't unstable. The current that it was drawing, close to 300 milliamps. Again, that's pretty close to what the RMS prediction was in LT Spice, so that looks encouraging. Uh, I'll set the frequency to two more um, levels. They'll do 20 meters now and have a look. That doesn't look too bad either. Let me put this on times 10 modes so and get a better close, better close up view. You can see that there's definitely some nonlinearities happening near the peaks. Uh, and that's to be expected. This is a class AB uh, final amplifier. It's not going to be as linear as pure class A, but we'll see uh, just how nonlinear it might be when I hook it up for spectrum analyzer mode. But one more thing here. Let's go to the 15 meter band and have a look here and turn the intensity up just a bit so it shows up better on the camera. And even that's not too bad. And that should be just fine. Uh, to work for all three bands, but like I say, I'll reset this for SA mode, take a closer look at those furs, and see what we got. All right, I've changed the setup. I've got the spectrum analyzer connected, and it's running, of course, to the 465. So what we're seeing now on the x-axis is frequency domain, not time domain. Another change that I've made is I've taken that 7 megahertz low-pass filter out of the rig and temporarily put it on the output of these HP signal generator before it goes into the amp. The reason is I want to get as clean a signal as possible for looking at the harmonics in the amplifier. And I'll show on screen now what the output looks like going through this filter. So the top of the screen is minus 20 dBm and it's right where that single pip is. And you can see where there's no other pips there at all. So I got a very clean signal going in. So that's going to work well. And of course I still have the Keithley here to monitor current and I've got 50 dB of attenuation between the output of the amp and the input of the spectrum analyzer. So the top reference level up here is 30, plus 30 dBm. So let me turn on the signal generator and we can see, I know it's probably a little hard to see with everything on screen, but that's the, that's the fundamental there. That's right at about plus 27, plus 28 dBm. So that's good. Second harmonic, third harmonic, fourth harmonic, fifth harmonic. Now the third harmonic does concern me a bit. Again, the amplifier is not perfectly linear. That's about 20 to 24 dB or so down from the fundamental. All this crap is going to go through into the final, plus whatever nonlinearities are going to be in my mixer. So this is 
acceptable. It's not as good as maybe I uh, would like if I had pure class A amplification, but we'll see <laughs> when I hook up the entire amplifier chain and run uh, all the signals through what my uh, signal cleanliness looks like coming out of the final. But I think this is going to work just fine. Uh, what I'll do in the next shot, I will check 14 megahertz, the 20 meter band, and 21 megahertz, the 15 meter band. Unfortunately, I don't have the filters built up yet for those three bands, so I'm going to have to take the filter out of the circuit here. So we might see a bit more uh, harmonics there than we would expect just because of the harmonics from the signal generator, but we'll see what it looks like. Okay, I've removed the filter. I've set the frequency to 14 megahertz. Let's have a look. And there's our fundamental. That's, again, pretty close to plus 27, plus 25 dBm. There's the second. There's the third. Again, it's down a little over 20 dB. And there's uh, the fourth. So not too bad. And there could be some contribution from the signal generator. But in any case, it's certainly not a lot worse than the 7 megahertz. So let me change it now to 21 and we'll have a look at that. And there's our fundamental and our second and I'll have to change the SA settings here to try to get that third because we're getting near the limit of what I can even measure. So there's the third and it's definitely about the same as the other two bands. I'd be much more concerned if it was significantly higher but it's not. So this is looking encouraging. I think this is going to work. And one final topic to talk about today, and that's the heat dissipation of this board. If you remember, one of my key reasons for going to this design was to go to class AB operation so I could eliminate the problem of excessive heat dissipation when the transmitter is just sitting here idling. That was a big concern with the 2N5109 version. It was getting hot enough that I was very concerned about the longevity of that transistor. So I'm happy to report I let this guy run for about five minutes with CW input, you know, continuous wave coming into it. It definitely gets warm. I mean, there is heat to have to dissipate. It's not 100% efficient, clearly and the temperature it got to was never at a point where I was concerned that it was going to overheat. So that problem is definitely solved. Now, what remains, it hopefully, knock on wood, is pretty simple. I just need to install this board into the rig, connect it up, and run the entire transmitter chain from microphone out to antenna and see how well it does. And of course, that'll be a topic for a future episode. Now, in um, parallel with me recording video for this episode, I've been working also on the software episode. That one is almost complete, so look for that in the next several days as well. As always, I thank you very much for watching the series and watching my channel. I do hope you enjoy this material. And until next time, bye for now.